أهلاً وسهلاً بكم uh, in our panel today, which is beauty in representation. Today we have a session about power, inclusion, gender power dynamics in probably one of the most psychologically brutal industries on women, the beauty fashion industry. On our panel, we have two women straddling a multitude of cultures and identities with millions of followers whose lives played across Instagram stories, TikTok analysis, and YouTube tutorials. Yet, each in her own way, deconstructed traditional power structures and rose to a place of power ownership and created her own seat at the table. Aizai, we only have 25 minutes today to discuss things that would take hours because you both lead such complicated and interesting lives. You've had such amazing journeys, for, both from a personal baggage, cultural pressure, to gender dynamics in your industries. And beyond the beautifully curated Instagram lives, there are so many hard-learned lessons that we have been privy to a few, and perhaps today we will get a few more from you guys. Halima is well known. She needs no introduction. A supermodel who walked away from the fashion world at the height of her fame while allowing us to share in her vulnerability, not shying away from discussing her own internal struggles in making that decision. And alongside being truthful about her journey, of who she was, what she became, and who she wanted to be, stronger than ever, she has returned to the entertainment and fashion world, but on her own terms. Muna Qattan, a former investment banker who became one of the most successful, who became a, a part of a trio of Arab sisters who co-founded one of the biggest global beauty companies. We are so proud to have the Qattan sisters, and Muna Qattan in particular, to talk about her journey as she also has branched out and now is both the global president of the world famous Huda Beauty, but also founder of her own personal perfume brand, Kayali, or Khayali in Arabic. She has millions of followers and knows what it means to make her seat at the table. Please welcome Halima and Muna. Thank you, Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you. I mean, uh, not many people are able to transcend their community, their nation, their region, to become global. And we have two women who did this. A huge round of applause, please, for them. I'm going to start by asking a few more personal questions, and then we go on to look at the lessons that these women who are attending today can actually learn from. So Halima, your story began in a refugee camp. You say you're the girl from Kukama, and you chose to walk away a couple of years ago from fame, from money, from attention, admiration, adoration, and you came back with your own demands, which were not guaranteed to be listened to. So why did you come back? And why didn't you choose something else? That's actually a really good question. And at 25, honestly, I'm still figuring it out. But that's the beauty of life. You can grow. You could always change course. You know, what you did back then isn't the career trajectory that you're going to have for the rest of your life. So don't be afraid of change. Welcome change. And so I think the interesting part that I should mention is fashion actually came to me. I didn't go seeking it, you know? So th that is powerful, you know, because the, the ball is in my court. And early on in my career, they let me bring a suitcase full of my own hijabs from back home. They were very, very accommodating. I said to IMG Models, one of the biggest modeling agencies in the world, the only way I'm signing this contract is if there's a hijab clause and if I can still live in Minnesota and if I traveled with a female chaperone. And they said yes to this day. 
But I was 19, and I came from a refugee camp, and not just any. Kakuma is the largest refugee camp in the world. I was born there, I was raised there, and then when I was seven, we had the American dream by moving here. And so it's, you wouldn't expect somebody from my background to be so bold, right? Because opportunities mean everything. It could have changed my entire family's life, my community. But I wasn't so eager to not have boundaries, to not set standards. And so what I saw was we'd be in Milan Fashion Week or any other country that I was working at, they would have a black box just for me to change in because that was, again, in my contract. And then when I saw that that same level of respect wasn't given to the other models, I'm a refugee. You're not going to treat me and give me perks and not apply that to the rest. So I couldn't sleep at night. And when the pandemic hit, I was like, why am I in an industry where girls are being treated this way, right? And I took a step back because when you don't know the right answer, take a break. I feel like we're in a society where it needs to be go, go, go. Take a break. And that's what I did for three years. Oh, that's amazing. And I think the... SubhanAllah, with COVID, maybe you didn't miss as much. And we also have somebody who has traveled around the world and lived around the world. Muna, your story started by being born in Tennessee, right? <laughs> so we, we see how cosmopolitan you are. And you say that your world changed when you came to Dubai. You came back to the Arab region. And I'd love to know a little bit more about your story, about, I mean, millions of Arab women we're known for, I mean, from Cleopatra, we're known for makeup, right? We love perfumes. The oud industry is amazingly huge. We're, we're exporting it all over the world. It is our culture. But what is the magic sauce that helped you in particular go from making things for your own use to actually creating a brand and being able to go global? Oh, that's a big question, but big I'll try questions. to keep it as short we're, as possible. We're not kidding around here in Forbes. <laughs> yes. I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of things that went into the magic, I feel. I mean, of course, I think part of it is being born into a world where social media was present. I think if we created the brand 20 years ago, I don't think we would have had the resources to necessarily make it happen so fast. So building an online community has been super integral to our business because we started with $6,000, you know, very little resources. And Six thousand dollars guys so anybody who has there's no excuses yeah and we've self-funded the entire journey and even when we got investors it wasn't for the business so the entire business has been self-funded so it's been really scrappy so I'd say social media and building a really amazing community of mainly women um, has been a big reason why we've been able to create such a big brand that's been received all over the world but I also think that it's partially just leaning into who we are like our roots our culture you know when we first started Huda Beauty .com, the blog, Huda was speaking mainly to the brown girls because nobody was really speaking to them. So I think just leaning into who you are and what makes you special, your culture, your background, I think that when you're proud of who you are, it's very special. And um, the same follows with Kayali, like the brand itself is inspired by the Middle East and the Middle Eastern culture. And um, to be honest, I was telling you earlier, like, I think if I didn't move to Dubai, I would have never started Kayali. It's inspired by the way Arabs use perfume. So I think embrace who you are. Tell it's me a little magic bit about Kayali. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying embrace who you are. So I know that layering, which is something that is, you know, very Arab, yeah. uh, is an important part. But can you tell us a little bit more about the brand and the things that you're doing that are maybe a little bit different? Like, how are you focusing? So you were heading or helping to uh, run a huge business, and then you get this idea. Did COVID play into this at all, for example? Yeah. I mean, we did launch the brand in 2018, so a little bit before COVID. But um, it definitely helped the brand grow because during COVID, people started really wanting to change how they feel in their own house without leaving their room. And fragrance is so powerful. Like I always say, your fragrances are magic in a bottle. It's like you can instantly change your mood, change your feeling, you know, especially with layering, you can create like 
you know, something that's confident but energizing or relaxing and, and calming. So it's like really something that people can use as a tool. So COVID definitely helped the fragrance industry for sure. But um, I would say that Kayali is all about celebrating Middle Eastern culture and making it global because when I was in the States, I loved perfume forever. I've always loved it because I am pretty sensitive and emotional. And I feel like people who love fragrances are usually a little bit more sensitive and emotional because it's an emotional thing. You know, it's something you can't see. Unlike fashion, unlike color cosmetics, it's like you have to be attached to a feeling. So I'm going to say something very strange. I have a particular shower gel that is very difficult to get from Jordan. And uh, it's in a certain bottle, and now they have a new bottle. So the old bottle is something that I also love visually. And I only use it when I'm very depressed. Because the minute I use it, it's like my special <laughs> shower gel. Magic. The smell of it. <laughs> the shape of it, it actually transports me immediately somewhere else. Halima, you, you said something very interesting. You said, I hated how they gave me something, the black box in this instance, that they, it wasn't given to other people and I felt very bad, I couldn't sleep at night. And so this kind of inclusion of people's needs, whether it's disabilities, whether it's a different way of, I keep telling them hijab is really the last you know, frontier because Everybody accepts everybody else, except if you're wearing hijab and you're a CEO of a global company. People don't accept hijab. They think of it as, as, as a backward thing. And, and you said, I couldn't sleep at night. How is the inclusion in the modeling? I'm sure there's a lot of women here who think about their daughters or themselves making it in that world. Is it better? Is it more inclusive? Are they able to allow people that look like us, whether it's hijab or without hijab, to be part of that uh, society, that elite society? Yes. I would say if you're looking for a career in fashion, now is the time, right? But I'm going to back it up. I remember being a young girl and like when YouTube and like, you know, with the hijab and like makeup when I was first interested, Huda and Muna were great inspirations, yes, all right? Of us. So we always had strong women from our region who are doing amazing things. We always had it. I think for me, being the first in a magazine, for example, I didn't have that growing up, right? To flip through and see somebody in a hijab. And so it was a great honor to be the first, but I literally made it my life mission not to be the last. Yeah. So That's I amazing. think if you wanna do fashion, first, a couple tips, right? You need to be strong and know exactly who you are because as the trends change, sometimes people want you to change as well. And so come in with strong values, know exactly who you are, and just know the right brands want to work with you. I'll never forget doing, um, being on, in Milan for Fashion Week and the first season I walked for Max Mara, I was the only one in a hijab. I come back one season later and they have six different scarves on the models worn exactly the way I had worn it. And Ian Griffith pulled me aside to say, you inspired this. Amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> Representation matters, right? Muna, I love that you've, you, you founded or co-founded one of the best beauty brands that all of us watched when we were young. Like, I think everybody has a Huda eyelash. In, yes, you know, like, or a whole you, closet. Uh, her closet, yes. And, and we've also watched you as you got married recently. We saw your life. We, we become invested in you as a person, and we want you to, to succeed. But you are successful. And we have a lot of women here who are mid-level managers or people who are interested in entrepreneurship. What are the kind of um, tips that you can tell them so that they can go to the next level if they want to. They could be stuck with a bad boss, they could be stuck in a career that they don't really enjoy. It could be, no, they're on the right career, they have the right boss, but they're just not able to make that leap. What are the kind of things that you mentor your own people to help them, to push them up? Well, I think self-awareness is the number one thing because I think all of us hold ourselves back more than anybody else. Um, so I think get to know yourself and ask yourself, what are my weaknesses? and start with you. Don't ever blame your boss, don't blame your team, don't blame your company, just blame yourself. 
and that's a bitter sw pill to swallow. Like it's hard to blame yourself, but as soon as you do that, you empower yourself to make a change. And I feel like my life changed when I started blaming myself for everything, like taking ownership and not saying, okay, this person is um, whatever it may be, like just fully taking responsibility. So journaling, having a therapist, having a, a life coach, but just inner work. I think that will take you to the next level and um, definitely spending time alone because you've got to do the inner work and to do that, you have to be alone for the most part. So okay. that okay. helped me a lot. <laughs> That's very interesting. I mean, I think this is the first time I've heard somebody say two things. Don't be desperate, right? Don't be desperate for that opportunity. Let them come. Be, and I think Oprah said it once. She's like, pick something, become so good at it, you become indispensable. And the other one is that you really do need that inner work and you need that alone time. And I think social media makes us actually not stay alone. Even if we're alone, we're never alone. But now I want to talk about why you, right? So what are the moments in both of your lives that shaped you, those defining moments? What are the traits that you have that perhaps you don't see in other people or you have it to a certain degree? Or other people have told you that you, maybe it's like, this is how our family is, but somebody tells you, well, no, this is not normal. Like, what are the things that are a bit different about you? Big sister can go first. Okay, sure. <laughs> I thought it was your little sister. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because um, both of you take a lot of risks, right? You, you take risks yes, and you make it seem yeah, so easy. Absolutely. I think the, the thing that makes me the most different, I feel, is probably my ability to stay really positive. Like in every situation that I'm in, I try to find the silver lining and I tell that to everyone. I'm like, no matter what it is you're going through, just try to find what is, what's the good part of the situation? Because there's always a good and a bad. And I think if you train your mind to find the good, you can turn every situation into a good one. So I feel like I'm an athlete at positivity. Okay. <laughs> when you're crying in the bathroom because a major problem happened, yeah. especially when you were younger. Every I mean, other day, by the way. <laughs> like, this is normal. Yeah. When you're devastated, where yeah. do you pull that strength? Where does it come from? Mm. Yeah, I, again, I think it's just, you know, centering yourself and reminding yourself everything you're going through is temporary. Everything does evolve. Nothing is forever, not the good, not the bad. And that's, yes. you know, it's, it's somehow, it's bittersweet. And for me, the saying, from God, that I am at the place where he thinks of me. Absolutely. That's when I'm like at the lowest. Mm. I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I just like, he's the most amazing <laughs> God that it will help me. And I just Absolutely. like, when I'm, re when I'm, when I'm really down. Yeah. Um, Halima, what are the moments that shaped your life that you can take such risks? Honestly, I had such an extreme life, you know? So it was interesting, like growing up in the camp, I used to see like the UN workers come to the camp and I just saw how the parents lit up, you know? And so I think at age six, I associated that with hope, which in a refugee camp you don't always have. And so I remember at six just thinking, one day I'm gonna come back to this camp and I'm gonna make my mom proud. And so when I took that first meeting with my modeling agency, I didn't say I want to work with Versace or I want this campaign. I said, take me to UNICEF, you know, take me to the UN. And I did my first ever trip to Kakuma and I did the first ever TED talk in a refugee camp. And I think that is the strongest thing you could do is don't just worry about your own trajectory. Bring your family, your community, others with you on that journey. And so, and so you guys give me strength, you know? I'm, I'm here in this beautiful country. Saudi women are incredibly strong. I got to meet both of my munas, and that's the way forward. We have to have each other's back, you know? We have to be each other's biggest cheerleaders. So I'm gonna tell the audience something that I don't usually share. I always try to meet the people that I'm gonna be interviewing on their own turf with their own people when they don't know 
why I'm there. They think I'm coming in to actually review. And that's what they think. Well, we'll review questions. I'm like, sure, I'll review questions. That's not the reason I see them. I actually like to go and see people in their natural habitat. How are they moving when it is actually under stress, right? There's something, you have to get dressed, you have to go. And the reason is that you really see what kind of person that person is. And they could be very nice to you, but they're not so nice to the person that is bringing in the papers, the tea, the person who's responsible for it. And I did this today with both of you. <laughs> and I just want to say, I actually felt so comfortable the minute I sat with you guys. And I kept thinking, I meet a lot of people. I mean, I've interviewed Christine Lagarde. I've interviewed Hillary Clinton. Why did I love being there? And I thought two things. One. Both of you are down to earth. And that's not easy. You have millions of Instagram. So what grounds you? What makes you normal? I'm, and, I, I, and they are really very normal, yes, uh, with a lot of better eyelashes <laughs> and beautiful clothings, but very normal. What grounds you? What brings you back and, so that you don't become that arrogant person who starts to treat other people like they're there just to serve? I think it starts from within, right? Because I learned not to take things personal. When somebody's, you know, mean or upset, usually it's just a reflect, or let me take accountability. If I'm not being pleasant to be around, it's usually a signal of what's going on internally, right? So I think know that in the back of the mind, not to take things personal. And that also applies to social media comments, right? When somebody's trying to attack you in the comment section and you're like, I don't even know this person. Learn not to take that personal. And then two, I would just say, understand that suffering is a part of life. Struggling is what makes for a good story. I mean, think about it. You read a book and the plot is not there. How quickly would you put it back on the shelf, right? So apply that same logic to your life. Like, you're in this movie, make it as fun and unique and different as you can. Everybody deserves to feel like a superstar because in my eyes you are, right? And so take ownership and pride where you're at in your journey and really own it. That's what it is. I feel like Mona, she's so confident. I try to be as confident as I can too, but we're all human. We make mistakes. You know, we need the same things in life, shelter, food, love, all of that stuff. And so connect to that part of our stories. Yeah. Gosh, you're hard to follow. <laughs> um, I mean, to be honest, I have to say, I have to give credit to my parents. They're so down to earth, so humble. They don't care about anything materialistic. Like, they're just very simple people. So I, I, I'm so grateful to them for raising me this way. But also, nothing lasts forever. You should never let anything get to your head. Um, you could have millions of followers on Instagram one day, and that could be irrelevant tomorrow. Like, don't get, uh, don't get too big-headed. It's not pretty. <laughs> like, I personally, you know, I've met people who are a bit more arrogant, and I have saw how it made me feel, and I'm like, I never want to make somebody feel that way. So, yeah. You both... I love you more. <laughs> love you. Thank you. you. You both touched upon family. I love the way that you guys are a trio of sisters who made this happen. I love the times you show your mom and the way that you honor her. Everybody loves their parents, right? But the way that you honor her is, is so central to who we are as Muslims and Arabs, right? And so this is something that is very important. You said that you would not leave Minnesota when you were younger because you wanted to be part of the community. I can assure you, 99% of anybody who gets a job when they're 19 years old and they say all expense paid trip and accommodation in Milan, Paris, New York, Los Angeles, most people would take it. I would. Take it. <laughs> I would. <laughs> My parents wouldn't let me, but uh, I would have. Um, and you have to actually make a lot of decisions with your, with your family, right? And the dynamics between sisters and business partners, your parents actually living with you guys in Dubai, that's also very interesting. So talk a little bit about your community, your family, and how that plays into your success. 
Sure. Um, would you like me to start? Yes. Um, yeah, you know, for me, my family and I are super, super close. I think part of it is also due to, like, our history. You know, we grew up in the States away from our secondary family, away from cousins, away from aunties. So it kind of bonds you and unites you. So we've always dreamt of doing things together and creating our own, like, little empire, our brand. It's always been a dream. So we are super, super close, probably too close sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> to where it can get a bit chaotic, but I do think that when you have that strong bond, um, A, you don't usually have an end goal in, goal in mind. Sometimes you do, but usually you don't, so it's like it's different than having just a team member who might one day want to leave. So I think that's why you see families creating empires that last longer than they do and like legacies that they can pass down. It's because you're united for something. Um, but but it's yeah. just difficult because if there's a problem, it's you difficult. Bring it home. It's also yeah, and it, we you know we're passionate people, so it's passionately good, passionately bad, you know. So it's it takes a lot of thick skin. It takes a lot of compromise, compassion as well to like get through things together. But and I think you are really the first sisters from the Arab world that made a huge. Usually somebody inherits it from the parents, so they they run it. But actually, I do think you are unique in that the only sisters that made something go, even regional, not even global, like even regional. So you're very unique in oh, that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. And, and, and it means a lot to me because it's a role model, right, for other families, other sisters who want to actually uh, grow their businesses. Halima, you and your mom. It's an amazing story. She, and she seems like, an, I, I mean, I do follow you on Instagram, so I see the pictures. And every time I see her, it's like, this is the first like, like, yeah. immediately. No, my mom is great. I'm, I'm very, very blessed. And BTW, if my, me and my sisters had to run a company, we can barely decide where to go for dinner. So that's really impressive that you guys are that tight-knit. You know, it, it speaks volume. Um, I think family is important. And I think especially our mothers, you know, they play such a big role, both in Islam and our cultures collectively. And so the beautiful thing about my mom is she made sure to teach me early on that I had many mamas. You know, when she dropped me off to school, we moved to America. She doesn't speak English. She said to my teacher, this is your daughter now. I was like, oh, my God, why would she say that? But she also taught me to respect the older women in my life, you know, whether they come in as teachers. And later on, I think my biggest success, honestly, has nothing to do with myself. It has everything to do with the strong team that I have around me of incredible women, whether that's an agent, a manager, a publicist. My team is the reason why I'm here today, why I get to do what I love the most. And so learn to cultivate friendship and mentorship early on we can learn something from everybody you could learn a lot from the homeless man on the street you know you can learn a lot from your grandmother who sometimes talks way too much and gossips all the time you can learn from literally anybody right so take advantage of that especially in a world where we're all glued to smartphones and we're so disconnected from one another that is the secret sauce I love that. Song. Ladies, yeah. ladies, um, thank you so much. I am going to have to ask you to wrap things okay. up. We have one more question. It's, just, it's the ending of this panel. We, I think we overran. I didn't realize there was a, a clock in the back. I'm so sorry. Can you just say one thing that you would like the girls or the ladies who are here today to hear from you as a message on success? Sure. Um, I'm going to try to keep one it short. Advice. Yeah, yeah, one advice, I would say lean into who you are, and that is what makes you special. That's what makes you different. And as soon as you start appreciating that, everybody else will too, and success will follow. So love yourself and celebrate yourself with the world. I mean, I have to piggyback on that. You just hit it right on the head and so I completely agree with what Muna just said because the world's going to pull you in different directions. People will tell you all about yourself so know who you are so you don't get swayed. 
Thank you, everybody, for you. being here. Thank you, Muna Halima, for being authentic, being real, talking about the things that usually we don't talk about in businesses. Usually we like to show a certain brand, and both of you are huge brands, but behind the brand there is a family, there's a community, there's determination, and there's a story that led that person to that position. And I hope today I was able to unpack a little bit of those stories. But you have two days to be able to pick the rest of it with them. Allah Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.